is Tuesday, August 31st. It is the Frontline Workers Pay Working Group uh, will come to order. That was, that was my gavel, uh, my kitchen table gavel. Uh, first up on the agenda, we have to approve the meeting minutes of August 26th. Senator Kiffmeyer, will you make the motion to approve the meeting minutes? I will move the meeting minutes and the previous meeting be adopted. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed nay. The motion passes. Thank you, Senator Kiffmeyer. All right, second up on the agenda, um, we've got the working group discussion of of our proposals and criteria. And I have to apologize, um, Representative Winkler. I didn't call you back yesterday. My husband actually had to have surgery. And so I wasn't in the hospital with him, but I was at the hospital and uh, he's doing fine. Everything's good, but um, that was why I didn't call you back. So I apologize. So this is the first we've been able to, to chat. So um, I know um, that Representative Frazier had text that maybe you guys have some language that you do want to discuss. And I guess I'll let you go first and then and then we can, we had a little huddle 15 minutes before before this, uh, Rep New and, and um, Senator Kiffmeyer. So if you want to go ahead with what you were thinking. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And yeah, I, I think, um, you know, the time has come for us to try to hash out some uh, specifics on how to do this. And so, um, uh, I have uh, a proposal, uh, both with some specifics as well as kind of a, a framework of an approach for how to do this that um, I think reflects uh, the priorities of the administration. I know that it reflects uh, priorities in the House and I think in the, in the Senate DFL, uh, as well as uh, a coalition of organizations uh, representing various frontline workers. And I'll start by acknowledging that um, uh, we believe, I believe that uh, many more essential workers uh, were essential, uh, were critical to our ability to uh, support our healthcare sector and to support our society, our economy uh, during a very difficult time than what we will ever have money to adequately uh, acknowledge them for. Uh, but that the uh, circle is broader than uh, just those providing direct care, because without uh, an army of people behind them, uh, they would not be able to continue to do that work. And we need to recognize the risk and cost um, that those other workers engaged in. And it was a team effort. It was uh, people from uh, almost every sector that were contributing in some way, shape or form. And so we uh, are starting with the premise that uh, I think the administration first laid out that the sector is included in House File 41 uh, is broader than uh, just uh, health care, uh, but they should be included in this uh, proposal. Um, and that should also include home care, transit, and temporary shelters. Um, but I think it's important that we not say everyone who works in those sectors is able to participate, uh, but only those who were obligated to report to work and did not have the option to telecommute um, because uh, you, you didn't face the same risk if you were able to work from home. And so uh, that would be one criteria that we would use. Uh, we also think that there should be a worker application process uh, to um, uh, present information to, uh, uh, I think, probably the Department of Revenue. Uh, that can be worked out. We can still figure that out. But they should workers should apply uh, and present uh, information that they meet the criteria that we establish. Um, and the kind of core of our uh, concept, in part, is that um, we don't know exactly how many people are going to apply. We don't know exactly how many people will fit the criteria that we establish. And so what we would like to do is designate a, uh, an amount of money that we think all workers should get, find out how many applications come in, and then essentially divide $250 million by the number of applications come in, that come in um, and set forth, you know, basically send those checks out based on how much we have and say that any amount uh, that we are not able to send out the next legislature 
uh, should consider uh, appropriating money and, and providing a la last round of checks. So um, it, we're thinking um, uh, of, of a $1,500 nominal amount, knowing that it is likely that nobody will get $1,500 because we will get many more applications coming in. But that is a meaningful uh, amount of money. And um, we'll see how many applications come in. Uh, and then, uh, you know, various things we think, I think we're all agreed that Minnesota income taxes should not be included. Uh, we shouldn't be marking uh, these funds against any uh, public programs that people would otherwise qualify for. Uh, and the state shouldn't be using this to capture revenue. Um, and that if there are administrative and outreach costs, that that should not come out of the workers' pockets, but that we uh, may set aside a separate amount for the administration of the program. So that's the place to start. Um, and I think that there are a lot of um, uh, ways that we can draw criteria uh, that can enlarge or narrow the potential pool. Um, but given that the limits on data and the limits on the ability to uh, administer a program, we think the application process, setting forth criteria and relying on workers uh, themselves to apply is the way to figure out how many will fit into this broader pool. Uh, thank you, Representative Winkler. I have a question. Um, was there a fiscal note that went along with House File 41? Uh, Ms. Madam Chair, I don't think uh, that there would be a fiscal note. The um, well, I, I, I should leave that to the bill author, uh, said Representative Frazier or Senator Murphy. Um, right. They would better answer that question than I can. Representative Frazier, Madam Chair, there, there were there were notes in terms of the there were fiscal notes associated with the amounts that would be cost that would be the cost for the departments that were impacted at the state level, um, but there was not an, an overall broad fiscal note for House File Forty One. I um, just doing my back of the envelope math um, fifteen. I, I think in House File 41, there, it includes 1.3 million workers in the state of Minnesota and $1,500 per person amounts to 2 billion. Um, and, and this committee is tasked with 250 million. So if you do the flip side of that math, it would end up being $191 per person if you included everybody in House File 41. So maybe, Maybe we decide what's a meaningful amount. Is 191 meaningful if every if you include everybody in House File 41? Because two billion, we we don't have two billion. We right. have 250 million. Yeah, and Madam Chair, I just I want to clarify one point. The the categories of of um, of occupations or sectors would be the same from House File 41, but it wouldn't be the same number of people because uh, the number of people that work in all of those categories isn't limited by things like uh, income. It might not be people who worked in those fields at the time. It will include a lot of people who were able to work from home. And we just don't have the detail on all the numbers. So we could create some estimates. Uh, but the, the, that number of people that you just described would be significantly less um, once an application process happened, because that includes all kinds of workers who would not qualify under criteria that we would set. So I just wanted to make sure that, um, you know, we weren't having a misapprehension about the size of the pool. Thank you. Uh, Senator Kiff, may I have a question? You're thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. So the question I have here, I feel particularly sensitive to the testimony we received. And it seems as though there is no consideration here of the level of risk. So when I think of people who worked in nursing homes, long-term care, where we had most of the cases, severe cases, as well as deaths, it seems to me that their risk and also nurses in, in hospitals, their level of risk was substantially higher. And from what I read in the federal rules, this, this is in many ways about that risk. And I'm not seeing in what you're talking about, and I think it's really, really important 
that those who had the greatest level of risk, uh, especially over that sustained early period of time, um, really deserve um, some greater compensation in regards to this. Um, and especially since it's already mentioned in legislation as well, so already the legislature has recognized that. So doing it equally to everyone without recognition of that, I think is a little well-intentioned, but I think misguided at missing the mark in regards to those um, folks. Um, thank you, Senator Kiffmeyer. And in the, the first special session, in we did pass um, that this working group must consider the increased risk of virus, virus exposure due to the nature of their work. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think that was the, the line we were thinking uh, with, with uh, we don't have a proposal, but we have an idea of how we'd like to go, um, is do, should they all be created? Should they all be get this bonus pay equally? I, I, if, I'm wondering where you guys are at in, is there, were there some occupations that did have an increased level of risk, long-term care, um, healthcare workers, um, compared to those others? I, I'm not saying everybody wasn't essential because everybody was and everybody stepped up to the plate to do their job, but we are, as this working group, supposed to consider those with an increased risk of the virus due to the nature of their work. Senator Murphy. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and um, to our, my colleagues. Um, I am really uh, grateful that we are to this point in our work because it's so important. And I, I bet just like I have, I'm hearing from a lot of people across the state of Minnesota um, sending us emails and sharing with us their experiences. I, I did want to touch base on the earlier question about um, House File 41, Senate File 331. Uh, because I do uh, understand from carrying that piece of legislation that that um, number of workers would be substantially smaller when we apply our criteria. So I don't want us to get stuck in that cul-de-sac with that math um, as we think about this. Um, but more importantly, to the, the really critical point that Senator Kipmeyer is raising about risk, um, I uh, have been you know, moved at every single meeting uh, by the testimony that we have received from workers in various sectors and have, you know, talked about uh, my own experience. And, you know, we, we all have our first and early experiences with the pandemic. Um, to remind you again about uh, my husband, Joe, who is a painter um, and was literally going to the grocery store in a mask and, and gloves, um, the N95 mask that he would wear for work, uh, he would wear it to the grocery store until he didn't have them anymore and would come home from the grocery store, um, which is the thing he likes to do, um, go to the grocery store. And then he would clean everything off on our back deck with bleach, um, because he didn't understand. And we didn't really understand if this was transmitted on surfaces, if it was transmitted by air. Um, by our breath, and we know a lot more now, which of course informs our decision making. But whether it has been the the people who work in dietary in a nursing home, or the nursing assistants, or the registered nurses, and the first person who testified was my colleague Mary Turner, you know, who talked about um, managing and working in somebody's airway, um, or the transit worker who talked about someone boarding um, her vehicle um, who had COVID. Um, and the driver of that vehicle went home to her multi-generational family, knowing she'd been exposed. Or the gentleman, the meat packer from rural Minnesota, who testified it last week um, about catching COVID and how that has changed his life and the way that he uh, continues uh, not to be able to do the work that he loved doing because of the infection. Or Amelia's father, who came and testified, I, I just think that because of our lack of understanding and because we um, expected people to go to work on those front lines, there were people that didn't have a choice and face those exposures that it is hard for us to assess um, a level of risk that is 
differentiated because so many people faced an unknown risk and did the work they needed to do, which is why um, after a lot of wrestling with this question and thinking about my colleagues in healthcare, um, that I did draw the conclusion that it was important for us to think more broadly than that, um, more broadly than those who, you know, absolutely bore a risk um, and not only facing the virus, but, you know, in the work that they did caring for people who were sick and dying, um, that's important to acknowledge, uh, but they aren't alone in that. Um, and in fact, I think it would be um, disheartening for those who stepped up, did that work that they were required to do um, without, uh, uh, or, and then saying that we're going to attach a different value to some versus others. Um, so I, I know that this is the hardest part of our work right here. Um, I'm coming to it um, with an open heart and a spirit of generosity, as I know everybody else is, and have faith that we'll work our way through it. But this question is a really important one, and I'm really glad you raised it, Senator Kipmeyer, and I appreciate you hearing my voice on it. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Senator Murphy, and I apologize for not getting back to you yesterday either. Um, uh, before I go to Representative Frazier, I, and maybe you can answer it, Representative Frazier, uh, that you brought it up, Senator Murphy, um, it, it may be helpful for us to understand what additional criteria you're proposing to narrow that pool of potential eligible applicants. I don't know who wants to answer that. I can, I can jump in. Um, okay, Representative Frazier. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, well some of the criteria, be, it would only be individuals that were required to go to work to work with people in person. I mean, that, that gets back to the issue that Senator Kiffmeyer raised about the risk. I mean, that is that that is the risk. If you had to work in person, if you had to interact with people on a day-to-day -day basis, um, day in and day out, uh, and, and particularly in the time frame that we're looking at that we would make uh, for people to, in the time frame that we're looking at that people would have had to work particular hours, uh, that was a time where we didn't know much about the virus. That was a time where there wasn't um, PPP, PPP readily available for everyone. Um, that was risk. I mean, that risk was posed every single day that those individuals showed up to work their jobs, um, to work those essential jobs, to allow for the other essential workers to go to work. And, and in that sense, I'm thinking about the child care workers to testify before us. Uh, they're still taking that risk every day. Many of them are caring for children that are under the age of 12 that cannot get the vaccine currently. So they're still taking on that risk every single day to, every single day to make sure that our um, essential workers can continue to do their jobs and to make sure that we can eat and can make sure that we can shop and do the things that we need to do to continue moving forward. So I think the risk factor is absolutely there. And I'd like to point out there is also other criteria within our charge that talks about the economic impact, the hardship. We have to, and I think we should consider that. And part of that is wrapped into the consideration when we look at being as broad as possible to make sure we capture those workers that have taken on, that have had that economic um, impact um, because they were required to work in person and because they were required to put themselves and their family at risk on a day-to-day -day basis um, when we did not know much about this virus. Um, thank you, Representative Friedrich. Uh, Fraser, I wonder how many people do that. Friedrich, a lot. <laughs> oh, I want to talk to your parents. Uh, um, thank you. I I completely agree. There was risk for absolutely everybody that had to go to work that didn't have the option to to work from home. Um, but I'm I'm still struggling with if if you think there was an increased risk. I mean, here if you were if you worked at a hospital, you had people going to the hospital with COVID, it was surrounding you, as you heard from um, Mary Turner. I mean, she's breathing in the face of somebody uh, with COVID and, and you're in a long-term care facility and, and there's outbreaks everywhere and you have to wear double PPE. Like, do you think there's an increased risk from working in one of those places compared to the others? And I'm not saying everybody doesn't deserve something. I'm just saying, if, if you're talking about risk, do you think there was a higher risk at some occupations, sustained contact, outbreaks, those kind of things where it, it didn't happen so much at all of the others? Um, Representative Winkler. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think you had asked a little bit about, uh, or you had asked about criteria. Um, you know, I think setting a minimum number of hours that you had to have worked during the pandemic period uh, is important. So somebody who just worked an hour or two by chance in the sector shouldn't be able to apply and get 
um, a, a check of that type. Uh, I think having uh, an income cap of some sort, and for example, we've heard, I think, from MMA saying that doctors are well compensated and aren't expecting, uh, even though they had additional risk, you know, they're not necessarily looking for this help, and there is a financial side. So having some kind of income cap um, that uh, acknowledges uh, the financial need element of this will help uh, as well. I think if we have an income cap, I think you know making some provision to include uh, nurses who may make a bit more money but uh, are, were among the hardest hit in their direct care would be one way of addressing uh, that additional risk. Um, and I would also throw in, here's the challenge. So um, meat packers were among the hardest hit uh, they had, uh, I think, zero successful workers' comp claims because we, we didn't include them in the workers' comp presumption. Um, and, you know, it's not what you would think necessarily the first thought you would have if you're thinking about who is at risk from COVID-19. Uh, but in fact, they were really hard hit. They were obligated to go to work um, and uh, they had no other recourse. So I think um, I think the way, in my mind, the way to address uh, the kind of equity of the situation or the fairness and acknowledging risk is by the criteria that we use for who can apply. Um, because I think it is awfully hard for us to make a determination that some workers were particularly hard hit and some workers were not. Um, we know in general, yes, if you had direct care of patients, uh, you know, that was a lot of risk. But there's also how many, you know, there is, as I said, a question of how many hours were spent. Um, some facilities had better setups than others. Some um, uh, had better access to PPP than others. So there were just so many factors that go into deciding who took on the most risk that having an equal amount spread across people in which people have to apply um, and we try to target a little bit based on uh, need as well as risk is is kind of the driving thought. Um, and I feel like I'm just, I'm happy that we're starting this conversation and I'm happy to talk with anyone anywhere about uh, how we dive into, uh, you know, coming out with a, a resolution here. Thank you, Representative Winkler. Um, Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you everyone for the comments. I think this is really productive. Um, and I, I appreciate the tone and, um, and the conversation so far. Um, and I also really appreciate Representative Winkler, what you just said regarding nurses. I think one of the things that I've thought about and I've had concerns about an income cap um, is because really some of those ICU nurses particularly are some of the best paid nurses in the hospital. And yet clearly they were assuming the greatest level of risk in, in working with COVID patients day in and day out. Um, and, and I agree with you on that. So I appreciate that comment. Um, and, and just for clarification on the House File 41, um, my understanding is that with House File 1, folks who were um, able to work from home were already excluded from House File 41. And, and so I'm wondering how we would whittle that down further. But I think that those folks were already excluded um, in House File 41. And so I, I'm assuming that the 1.3 number that we got from Deed at the beginning of our working group um, accounted for that. Uh, but I guess I don't know for sure. So that would be good to have clarification on that. Um, I, I just, I just want to comment and um, sort of echo Senator Kiffmeyer's comments um, on, on risk and the assumed risk, particularly from, I mean, certainly we all know our long-term care staff, um, our hospital nurses, our, our first responders who were going into situations um, to provide medical care in, in unknown situations really where, where there was significant risk as well. Um, I, I struggle because we have heard so much compelling testimony throughout the last uh, several weeks. We've heard really compelling testimony and really um, stories that were hard to hear uh, about different experiences from individuals and families. It's been, it's been, I think, probably a little difficult for all of us to hear some of those stories. Um, and yeah, I, I struggle because um, 
I do want to make sure that that what we are giving folks is meaningful. That that is really a, an important piece to me, and I think to my constituents, um, to to make sure that what we're doing here is meaningful. And so I'm a, I'm a little bit concerned about. Um, it's hard for us, right? We've been tasked with making really hard choices um, and choices that probably none of us actually want to make. Um, perhaps perhaps all of us have, have, have rethought this assignment a little bit over the last month and a half as we think about the decisions we have to make. Um, but for me, the thought of making those decisions means that I, my conscience tells me that I have to focus on those long-term care workers and and nurses and first responders, those folks who really were assuming the highest degree of risk. And I think one thing that we have to be really careful as a working group to think about as, as we're making these decisions is um, there were a lot of folks who were working in situations that were scary because, because of the unknown particularly in the beginning of the pandemic, we had a lot of folks who were willing to do these jobs, not really knowing what their risk was. And it made it scary. Um, and at the same time, we've learned over time um, that fortunately, it, it was a good positive thing that, that the risk involved in a lot of those jobs really was not what we had feared. Um, and so I think we need to be a little bit careful as we make these, again, really hard decisions. I think we need to be careful about equating fear with risk, because I think the fear was real. And I think that probably all of us, and certainly as legislators in the beginning of the pandemic, I mean, we, I think we were all there. I mean, it wasn't just the public. We were there and, and we did great bipartisan work in the beginning of the pandemic because we all understood that there were so many unknowns and we had to be prepared and, and we had to do the very best that we could to, to keep people safe. Um, but we know more now. And I think the decision we are tasked with now particularly, and, and I, I, I like a, a longer period of time that we're considering, you know, folks who worked over a longer period of time. Um, but over that longer period of time, we, we really did learn a lot about the virus and the level of risk in, in different environments. And so I, I do think it's so important. And frankly, kind of a slap in the face to our healthcare workers, our, our nurses, those folks who were holding hands in those long-term care settings um, where it, it wasn't if they were going to be dealing with folks and caring for folks who were dying of COVID, it was when. I mean, it was a part of their life. Um, I'm so concerned about a token for them. I want to make sure that those folks who we know assumed so much risk um, and, and burdened so much of the uh, emotional hardship of COVID as well as they cared for these, these patients with COVID and those who passed away, I wanna make sure that what we're doing is meaningful for them. Um, and I, so again, as far as questions go, when we're looking at the bucket from House File 41, um, like I said, those folks who were able to tele telework are already excluded from that. I don't know if that was included or accounted for in, in that initial projection from DEED. It, clearly, they, they had told us that there were limiting factors for them in, in coming up with the numbers that they had. Uh, but I, I'm just concerned that with the number of people included, even if that number gets whittled down a little bit, I think we're just looking at, I think we're looking at an award that feels much more like a token than something that is meaningful for those who really were assuming the most risk and, and frankly caring for our communities and our loved ones in a way that is different um, than, than a lot of the folks that we heard from. Thank you, Madam Chair.
Thank you, Representative New Brindley. Um, Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, again, appreciate everyone's comments. I just feel really, really strongly that probably the biggest thing is that um, I see it as the risk of the known. They knew they were working with COVID patients. They knew in the long-term care in the nursing homes and those situations, they knew versus the risk of the unknown, um, which was different. But I think that the um, those who knew the risk continue to take care of patients knowing the intense risk that they had um, deserve special consideration. I think that is recognized both in federal rules and in other areas as well. And I think we would be remiss at um, not uh, accommodating for that. I think that is just really, really important uh, that we do that. And that was that risk of the known. And I think that is unique and particular uh, to that group of people that long-term care, nursing homes, nurses as well, I think that deserve that special consideration. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Frazier. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just wanted to speak quickly to the, the House File 41. Well, I got a couple of things, but I'll address the House File 41. Those numbers, uh, that 1.3 million, they did not exclude folks that were telecommuting. Um, when we got the information, and that, that was a struggle during this session, to, we, we went back and forth on those numbers because we could not get those numbers. It was hard for the for deed to tell us or delineate or um, break it down and segregate it to where they could tell which workers were telecommuting or not. So that 1.3 million is essentially saying that everyone would have access to what House File 41 was trying to do. And that just, uh, in practicality, that would not have been the case. So I just wanted to make that clear for Representative New Brindley. And also to, to Rep New Brindley, I, I think the, the point you made about the, the fear of the unknown versus, you know, what kind of what we know now, um, the, the fear was there because the, these folks knew they were taking the real risk. I mean, there were unknowns, but the, what they really knew was that they were risking their lives and they were risking their families' lives every day that they went to work. And I could say that uh, we, we clearly have seen when the cluster data was showing about where the outbreaks were, if you were in close proximity to other individuals, there was a real risk. And that risk was bore out in the data that we saw that, was, that has been presented to us. So we know that. I mean, we have the data to back up this conversation that we're having around that. All of these essential workers had the risk, um, had the risk of contracting the virus. And in fact, many of them did. And, and, and that leads to the financial impact that many of them had. Many of them had to quarantine. Many of them didn't have vacation days or PTO or sick days to cover that time off. So they had that financial risk and impact that they took. Many of them actually caught the virus. And they had, they had medical bills that they had to cover to do that. That's another financial risk. It also harmed them and their family as well. So I think we've got data upon data and testimony upon testimony to know that all of these individuals that we're trying to cover here, that we're discussing in the parameters that we've laid out, they had the risk. So that's covered. And also the financial risk also covered. Two other things that are included in the language that we need to consider. Thank you, Representative Frazier. E even if it's half the number of the 1.3 million in House File 41, um, that's still a billion dollars. Um, and we have 250 million, so I just want to make that point. And also to your point, um, Representative Frazier, exactly, there was fear in the in the beginning for everybody um, not knowing if you were at risk uh, or or increased risk or what your risk was. Um, there was fear for everybody, but now we know where there was increased risk. Um, there definitely was increased risk in our our healthcare facilities, and there was. I mean, most of our deaths uh, came in long-term care facilities. So there was definitely an increased risk. And we know that now. We know that now when we're going to be um, awarding these, these bonus pays for, for those workers. Um, and I, I sympathize uh, with everybody at that time because we were all there. Like Representative New Brindley said, we were all there. The fear was there for all of us. But now we're a year later and... And we know that some of those workers and continue to have increased risk every single day that they go to work. They're still double masking 
uh, at the hospitals and the um, long-term care facilities. So we know where the, where the increased risk. Um, Commissioner Doty. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to, in an effort to kind of understand kind of where we are and kind of moving us toward, um, hopefully moving us closer to agreement of some sort, um, wanted to just clarify, um, for those who, I mean, I, I appreciate the comments regarding risk, and I appreciate the um, um, the emphasis on those who, um, uh, you know, who had some of that, uh, like the long-term care and the nurses, some of that that um, that direct care risk, if you will. Um, but I guess I'm, what I'd like to understand and the, understand the feelings um, um, are you saying that um, uh, that we would be, you'd be open to a couple things. One, like a two-tiered kind of a kind of a kind of a deal where there was a one like kind of one amount for say some of those nurses or long-term care um, workers, and then another amount for other workers. Or are we? Or are you saying that um, that you'd be more comfortable with, in a sense, just recognizing those long-term care um, workers in total and not expanding the pool to um, to some of the levels that maybe is in House File 41. I'd just like to really understand kind of where we are on that continuum, because um, again, I think this is a very important part of our conversation. So um, i just throw that out as a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Doty. Um, Actually, that is kind of the, the road we were heading down is a, a, a two bucket. Those that, I, I, you just teed it right up. Um, those that actually, that we now know um, had increased risk uh, uh, when they go to work every day. Um, I, like Representative New Brindley said, is it, I mean, and they continue, and they continue to go to work every day. And we know that they, uh, you had people going to the hospitals with COVID, being uh, put into the nursing homes from the hospital with COVID. Um, those people uh, really had an increased significant risk um, by going to work. So I think the two bucket approach um, is, is a, a road we should actually look at. Thank you. Um, Senator Murphy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and uh, again, Grateful for the tone. Uh, I I want to I want to echo something that President Mary Turner said in her first testimony, um, and that she encouraged us to think beyond healthcare workers uh, when we think about this work. Um, and that, of course, is because she understands um, the virus, the disease, how it spread, um, and the toll that it took on people. Um, and I really appreciate that because it would be, I suppose, in her self-interest um, as the president of the Minnesota Nurses Association to think first for the nurses. But that's not what she testified to. Um, and that's not what she asked us to consider. And I think it's important for us um, to, to think about a few things. And I, I, I think maybe it was Ryan Winkler, um, Senator, excuse me, Representative Winkler, sorry, Rep Winkler. Um, at our last meeting, who talked not only about risk, but about loss um, and hardship. And uh, those are all elements that we need to consider. And I, I appreciate Rep Brindley's um, comments about fear, but what I've mostly heard from people is determination. Um, they knew it was their job. They knew that they were called um, to go do the thing they needed to do whether it was making sure that they were taking care of our vulnerable Minnesotans in nursing homes or people who were sick with COVID or other conditions in the hospital, or that they were working in meat packing plants to make sure that farmers who were livestock farmers had a place for their things to go and that we were providing food for Minnesota families across the state of Minnesota. And when I think about the meat packers in particular, um, they were required to work in close quarters. There's no way to do that work spread out. It is production, like manufacturing, um, like the way my dad built cars. Um, 
and they were not provided adequate PPE. Um, and of course, there were outbreaks there because of the nature of the work, because of the proximity that didn't allow for social distancing, and because of the lack of protective equipment. Um, so of course, of course, they faced more risk, and they went to it anyhow, fearlessly. I think fearlessly. So I, I do want to tease apart those two strong feelings of fear and risk and call out really uh, the Minnesotans who, who did, they did the thing that we asked them to do, um, go to work um, and do what we need done um, so that the economy keeps moving. And so we keep as many people healthy and alive. And they not only you know, got sick themselves or their family members, or they had to quarantine and they lost wages, or they used their own leave time so they have no vacation time left. Um, they lost wages, they lost vacation time, they lost uh, financial footing, they incurred healthcare costs. They did it because we asked them to. Um, and I think it is, it is, uh, a, a, it is from my perspective, hard to say who among that group of people uh, is more deserving. Because from my perspective, they all did their part to get us to where we are today. Um, so most importantly, I think I want to tease apart the risk and the fear um, to recognize that the nurses who, you know, were at the center of the nurses and the people who worked in healthcare so at the center of this, when we think about, and lots of people think about this, they're saying, make sure we include everyone and we should. Um, and that the, the risk was both to health, uh, to well-being, but also financial risk. And many people paid a price among these front frontline workers. Um, and that's why I think this this, this inclusion, this discussion about inclusion is so important. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Um, to that, that risk versus fear, we've um, in our brainstorming, uh, actually a couple of weeks ago, I just found the piece of paper right here. Um, we were, we put together this, this rubric on increased risk because our, our, our language actually says increased risk. So, so if a, if a worker, what was their risk of, of a COVID, of, of exposure to COVID, the duration of exposure to COVID, um, confirmed COVID outbreaks amongst workers or residents or clients. Um, and we know in both the hospital facilities and long-term care facilities, um, there, were, there was multiple exposures and, and long-term prolonged contact. Um, stretching the, the workers at these places, um, mental and physical, um, ability, uh, they had, um, they had to shelter at their workplace or outside of on, on their home, home on days off, um, limited interaction with loved ones to minimum risk of transmission, required extra shifts um, due to the pandemic, uh, COVID mitigation, they had to wear full PPE always, and they had, they had frequent COVID testing uh, and these are just these are just criteria that we went through um, the unav unavailability of full PPE um, and also the frequency of their quarantines um, and they were prohibited from working with asymptomatic positive they're like like if their increased risk risk is our criteria maybe that's a starting point and go back to Commissioner Doty and and the two buckets you know huge difference in increased risk not fear but risk. Um, Senator Kiffmeyer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, I just wanted to clarify that sometimes there's a talk of the risk. And again, I reiterate, there was the risk of the known. But at the time, long-term care nursing homes, elderly and those in hospitals, they knew the risk. It was actual and real and great and sustained. They knew the risk not the fear of the risk, but they knew it, they were in it. There was cases and diagnoses and, and um, severity around them that was absolutely incredible. And I think the big thing is they knew then and um, stepped into it anyway. I don't, I, I think uh, that sometimes, uh, while we've heard some of these others, I, I tell you, there are many, many stories of, of that situation. And I just really think um, that's a really important consideration. And I just wanted to clarify though, they knew 
It wasn't just a risk. They knew and acted um, with compassion and with skill at a critical time for people. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kiffmeyer, Representative Frazier. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just I want to echo what um, Senator Murphy said earlier about the fact that people were brave. They showed up. I mean, that's that's why we're calling them heroes. We're not calling them heroes because they abandoned their post and they didn't do their work. We're calling them heroes because they were brave and they showed up every single day to do the work that was asked of them. And and I, and again, I'll go back to the data that we've been shown tells us that it was a real risk. There were breakouts in other sectors other than long-term care and at our, at our hospitals. Uh, and I'll tell you, uh, long-term care, two of the biggest long-term care facilities are blocks away from my home. I just visited one in person the other day and I took a tour. I talked to staff there. I talked to administrators. I talked to the managers. They're important. They're important for us. They're important to our community. Very important to my community. A lot of jobs there. So I understand that those workers all right, we, we absolutely understand what the risk was for those workers. And we absolutely understand the reality of what those workers faced every day and still face now. But those, that same, those same factors were in place for other workers as well. And I just want to be careful because I feel like we're having a conversation around excluding workers. And I think the most important thing around that is that uh, Representative New Brindley mentioned earlier about having a token and, and what that may mean to workers. Well, I also think it's going to mean a lot to workers if we exclude them, if we don't acknowledge and recognize and honor more workers as broadly as possible with the resources that we have. And, and one more important thing I think is that we're the legislators. We could put forth a recommendation that says, hey, we need a little bit more money to make sure we can recognize all of our heroes. Thank you, Representative Fraser. And I'm sorry if I, I was going down the path that we wanted to exclude anyone. I, I You're absolutely correct. Everybody that did go to work um, during the pandemic that didn't have the option from working from home. Um, we're Madam Chair, I just want to really speak oh. clearly and strongly as well. Nobody oh. is being excluded here. We're talking about something else. There was no mention of excluding in this particular case. Thank you, Senator Kiffmeyer. That's where I was going to. Yeah, we didn't want to exclude anybody. And all of the testimony that we received over the last um, month has been very compelling. Um, but I do want to point out, Representative Frazier, that set nearly 70% of our deaths due to COVID happened in our long-term care facilities. So there, back to Commissioner Doty, and you're, you're next on the list here, Commissioner Doty. Maybe a, a two bucket proposal is is something we should look at um, those with really increased risk um, and another bucket not leaving anybody out that was truly essential and frontline. Um, Commissioner Doty. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, let me clarify. Um, my my question from before um, I was I was asking for clarification in terms of of what um, of what others were thinking in terms of a two tier approach I'm not necessarily recommending that at at all one of the things that I do want to also inject in the um, our thinking or remind us of is um, is the the whole the administration and the logistics of the process of getting payments out. Um, one of the things that we heard clearly from a number of those who've testified, and I've heard this, I mean, we've all received a lot of emails and, and things from a lot of frontline workers, and clearly the idea of, of, of a meaningful amount and getting something out as soon as possible seem to be very important items. One of the things that we heard from Louisiana when they gave us a presentation was um, the importance of, of, of establishing criteria that um, was easy, easily val validated and, um, and that didn't, um, you know, make the process, didn't weigh the process down, if you will. And, um, and I was able to actually go back after the presentation and spend some time with the folks from Louisiana to really get a better sense of, of how they actually did what they did. And, and, and I would be really concerned with the idea of a two-tiered um, an amount, because I think that would, again, um, make the process of getting 
um, the checks out a lot harder. I mean, because you've got you've got two groups of people within the same bucket of money that need to have different amounts or whatever. So um, I just want to just make sure that, that we aren't forgetting about about what it's going to take to get this money out. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Doty. Uh, Representative Winkler. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And I just thinking about our kind of process here a little bit, um, you know, we have um, a couple of different approaches that we've discussed in the hearing today. Uh, I think that uh, having some uh, more detailed conversation uh, is important. And I don't, I, I want to just say that I think um, uh, uh, we don't want to have a discussion about priorities become a conversation about um, who is the most uh, valued or who is the most impacted. And I don't think anybody's trying to do that. I just want to caution our conversation a little bit today that we not go too far down that road because we're not going to succeed in saying uh, one group is, uh, uh, you know, in some way more uh, merited than another. And I'm not accusing anybody of doing that. I'm just simply saying that our debate or our conversation, if we can get to the point of where we're talking about mechanics uh, and less about kind of bigger values, I think we're going to move ahead. Uh, and that's the spirit where in which with which we kind of brought some specifics to the table. And I think um, uh, given the kind of level of development of both sides uh, proposals or the two proposals we're hearing about, the two concepts we're hearing about today, I think uh, having a little bit more one-on-one uh, -on -one conversation might be beneficial um, so that we can share a little bit more uh, details and kind of work through mechanics a little bit. Um, to see if there's ways that we can accommodate each other. So my point being, I think everybody wants to do as much as we can for as many people as we can. Um, and there are merits and uh, disadvantage with, with both approaches we're talking about today, but it is not about the workers themselves. It is not about the people. It is about uh, how to assess those priorities. And I think diving into more specifics um, would be a beneficial way to do that. I'm not sure if we're prepared to do that at this moment, but I think that would be the next step of conversation. Thank you, Representative Winkler. I was thinking that same thing too. We can um, do some more work over the next day and come back um, Thursday uh, with some more specifics. Um, and then we do have a couple more testifiers coming up, but we will go to Representative Frazier. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Winkler touched on a bit of what I was gonna say. I just wanna say, I, I, I think we've had a very compassionate um, and sympathetic tone um, throughout this, throughout the work groups, throughout the work that we've done as a work group since we've been meeting. And, and my my comments earlier were just to point out that uh, I, I didn't want us to go down a path that I didn't think we were meaning to go down as we're having this conversation about criteria and who should who should be included in the uh, in the disbursement of the funds. Um, but but again, I, I do want to just one more thing is I thought about was that you know when we're talking about the the risk uh, and the reality. Uh, we have just had two outbreaks in our school districts. So again, in the middle of a pandemic and knowing what we, we know more now than we knew back then, we are still having outbreaks, which shows that the real the risk is still very, very real for our essential workers that are showing up to do their work um, every single day. Just, just wanna, I just wanted to point that out because uh, in real time, we're still getting data that supports uh, the, the reality of the risk. Thank you, Representative Frazier. Um, I don't know if anybody else has anything to add for today's discussion. Otherwise, we will pick it back up on Thursday. All right, that being done, we are going to public testimony. We have two public testifiers today. Um, the first one is Maria De La Luz Lopez, Wellness Director at Benedict Benedictine Living Community of Minnesota. I am looking for... Maria, I see. Oh, there, you're unmuted, Maria. Go ahead and introduce yourself for the tape. Oh, we can't hear you or see you. I'm going to hold tight, Maria, and I'm going to go to um, Michael Lindholt, uh, Vice President of Highway Employees with AFSCME Council 5. And then Maria will come back to you. Go ahead, um, Michael Lindholt. Um, State your name for the record and go ahead with your testimony. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and, and working group members. 
My name is Michael Lindholt, and as she stated, I work for the Department of Transportation. I am also the vice, pre uh, vice president of the Aspen Council 5 Highway Policy Committee. So I'm speaking on behalf of all the MnDOT workers across the state of Minnesota. We have over 5,000 of them across the state. And uh, we were not included as the essential workers in the governor's orders and that. So we continue to work throughout the winter, throughout the pandemic, throughout everything in here. We plowed the roads, we cleared everything. The call came out for us and we always answer with a resounding yes. Uh, we worked through the Republican convention, we worked through the Super Bowl, we worked through holidays, we worked through all of this because that's our job that we're tasked to do. I'm respectfully asking that, that you consider the request of the frontline workers, including the employees of MnDOT and Department of Transportation, be included in your, in your immediate uh, bill there, frontline workers. Transportation employees were not protected by the stay-at-home order. Excuse me, I'm reading from my speech here, <laughs> typed up. Uh, transportation workers were not protected by the order. We showed up day after day. Uh, we couldn't help but use you know, accrued paid time, sick time. During, if we had to quarantine, we had 13 shops go down across the state and, and were forced to quarantine on this that some didn't have time to do that. Um, we the, the PPE was handed out. We did uh, use masks. We did try to stay six feet apart, but we're only limited to amount of trucks that we use. So we were forced to, when we patch a hole, I can't patch that from home or plow the roads from home or things like that. I had to get in the truck with workers and then and, and together in a, in a six pack truck with six workers or four workers and go out there and fix guardrail and patch holes and close a road and, and all of these things that we do as the transportation workers. So you may not think of us as heroes as, as, as in the pandemic, like the nurses and the doctors were with the front line. But I think we were part of that team that helped keep Minnesota going. We had essential workers that, that did come in and, and haul. We got into trucks. We have commercial driver's license that we hauled up to White Earth when the pandemic was really rampant up there, that we put our job aside and hauled trucks up north so that they could get food. Um, again, but it does take a team to get through these times and a part of the frontline team. We keep our roads clear during winter storms. We go days, you know, we go days without days off to clear the clear the roads, and, and without us, you know, the things would come to a halt. You wouldn't be able to get supplies and things like that for the pandemic or food to restaurants or doctors and that. So I think we are considered a, a critical part of that team, and, and you know, a maintenance worker as I am, I work overnights. I'm the uh, overnight driver currently for the summer. So I do the emergency stuff, clearing roads, uh, things like that that you don't see a lot of nighttime. We have 13 shops just in Metro alone that, that do night work and then they work around the clock while everybody goes to sleep. They do the work that keeps Minnesota moving. Um, deli uh, we deliver things, you know, the, so the roads are open so you can get things to your stores or suppliers or local child care provider shops. You know, if we were be forced to set home and weren't part of this critical team, uh, Minnesota would almost come to a halt. There'd be a lot of things that wouldn't stay moving. Roads would be closed. We've seen that during government shutdowns. Things were just shut down, you know, and, and me being a worker, I, I'm rounding the corner coming up on 20 years here. I think this winter will be 20 years. Time goes by quick. But uh, Frontline Worker is independent and really does take a team. Uh, please value the entire team when you consider the, the funding of Frontline Workers and consider this in your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representatives. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Lynn Holt. Um, and thank you for continuing to go to work every day. Um, we really appreciate it. Uh, next up, I hope we have found you, Maria De La Luz Lopez. Cannot hear you, Ms. Lopez. Hello. There we Can go. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yes. Awesome. Thank you for this opportunity, uh, representatives and, and senators. I appreciate it. Uh, for our case, when this happened, when it started, I concur with all that you're saying, listening to you guys. I, it sounds like you put a lot of work into it and the effort that you're looking at of who are the ones that deserve the money more than others. Uh, definitely, you know, there was fear, like you said in the beginning, and with the risk and understanding the risk, but because we knew, especially in long-term health care, we had to uh, still provide 
the care in insecure and stabilized residents because they didn't know what was going on and families couldn't come in. So the psychological part took a, a, a toll on all of us uh, a year ago today. And now we're finding out that we're still in that pandemic pandemic mode. However, in the meantime, as of last year, uh, in the beginning of this, the with the, all the uncertainties, we lost a lot of staff, nurses, aides, and other workers. Some retired, some resigned, and some never came back. And the thing is that for us in the wellness department, who provides the psychological, emotional, spiritual aspect of their lives, uh, we spend like uh, 75 to 85 percent of our time with them. So definitely us as uh, uh, site professionals, we too have been at high risk and continue to be every day that we come because whether other staff have it or residents uh, acquire COVID, we're still at risk. And, you know, I understand other factors of people that the service they provide, but we're still in that pandemic mode, whether it's in the hospitals or in long-term care, any kind of elderly care, which are the most vulnerable and need us. And one of the hardest things to have had to endure, because I too lost a wellness staff, because of the same fear and the uncertainty as all our worlds was coming apart. So, but we risk a lot psychologically, emotionally, and the physical endurance because I myself had to work every other weekend. And so my life was cut as far as any pleasure other than work and coming to work, knowing the high risk of it. So along with the aides and nurses and even the person who mops the floor to the person who takes care of the infection control, we're all at risk and continue to be. And we don't know how long this is going to take. So that's my take on this, and we have no incentive. If the nurses already have incentives, they have gotten raises, the aides are getting raises, they have gotten $2 and $25 more, guess what I got back in January of this year? 35 cents raise. And I too have to come in to work with all the risks. So does my assistants, we, and so does the person that mops the floor, makes the bed, clean the windows, we all still have to come, but the only ones that get the incentive are the nurses and the aides. And we would like to see something more than $50 for our incentive. So the state has to look at it. CMS has to look at it. So I thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Maria De La Luz Lopez, the wellness director from Benedictine Living Community of Minnesota. Thank you so much for going to work every day and, and the risk you are facing now that we are in the uh, fourth um, fourth wave of, of COVID sweeping through the state. Um, members, don't forget to look at the, te the written testimony. There's quite a few of them um, in, the, in the link there on the agenda. Um, one from Cindy Cunningham from McPin, and um, I think there's like 10 more. So I wanna thank everybody for their, their written testimony also. Um, are there any members that have anything else to add? Otherwise, um, I think this was a really, really good discussion. I want to thank the testifiers. Um, we've, we've had a lot of testimony out over the last month, all of it compelling, um, a lot to think about. But I think it would be a, a really good idea for us to come up with some specifics um, and bring them to the next meeting on Thursday that you, Representative Winkler, will be chairing. So I'm going to toss it to you if you want to say anything before we adjourn. Uh Madam Chair, I guess I would just say that, uh, you know, anybody who has not had an opportunity to testify and would like to, we will still be doing that Thursday. And I hope that uh, we can have some meaningful conversation uh, between now and then and look at some uh, ways of kind of uh, finding a path forward that we can all be on board with. I, I will say this. I don't think that filing majority and minority reports uh, on September 6th is a terribly productive activity. And I think we should be moving towards agreement uh, rather than uh, something like that, even though it's called for in the legislation. 
Uh, thank you, Representative um, Winkler. I agree too. Let's get an agreement uh, and get this done here and come forward with a, a proposal for both the House and Senate that we can that we can get this money out to these uh, essential Minnesotans as quickly as possible. Representative Frazier. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will say I third the idea of, of hoping we can get an agreement um, to come out of this um, at, our, at our deadline that's quickly approaching. I, I did want to say, and this this uh, this came to mind after the the the, the, the last testimony there. She talked about um, getting an incentive. You know, when I met with when I went to the long term care facility near my house, and I met with them, we talked about the uh, the the issues that they're having with recruiting and retaining individuals. And I know that as a legislator, we have an impact on raising and increasing those rates. For those workers in long-term care facilities and how those reimbursement things work and i think if, if there's any way possible i know that we have our charge here but i also know that uh, many of the testimonies has uh, of folks that testify has have given us an idea of what some of the systemic issues are um, that we can have an impact on and, and if there's any way that we can work that into whatever we do um, as we come into a special session, I think we should we should consider that because it could be it could be a long term impact for our long term care workers and uh, and and the other workers in those fields, essential working fields, as we move forward. So I, I just wanted to put that on the record and mention that just to put out there for consideration as we move forward. Thank you, Representative Frazier. Uh, task at hand is two hundred and fifty million. That's our parameters for this working group. Um, with that, members, thank you so much for. Um, being here today and I guess we'll see you on Thursday. See you. Meeting is adjourned. Recording stopped.